Good morning, class. Hope you've had a good week. Hope the summer's working out good for you. Um, we continue to uh, do our class online. We're going to keep doing that for the future, it looks like. Near future, anyhow. Uh, it's been good to see some of you in church. The ones who have chose not to come, we miss you. I totally understand uh, why you choose not to come. And uh, just we're all trying to stay safe, do what's best, make the right choices. Seems like it's hard to know exactly what the right choices are in today's world with this virus. But, uh, but we'll get through it. God is in control. God is good. So... Um, before we start today, let's uh, start with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, I just come before you and praise you for being who you are, for being our God, for being our spiritual father, for allowing us to be adopted as your children. As We just praise you for the blessings you give to us, the grace and mercy you've shown to us. Lord, we ask that your will will be done in our lives, that your kingdom will grow here on earth, that we will be good stewards of what you give us and also good servants of you. Pray that you continue to guide us with your spirit. We ask you to guide us with your word. We ask that you be with us now as we study your word, that um, we will listen to it, we will take it for what it is and treat it with the reverence that it deserves. And, I ask that you continue to be with those who are on our prayer list, Lord, those who are struggling. Give them strength and courage. And I ask that you continue to just open our eyes to help where we can. And we ask and pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right. Uh, we're in Colossians 2, uh, chap chapter 2, verse 8. And... Uh, Colossians was written here uh, to the church at Colossia, and uh, Epaphras was ministering there, and he had asked Paul to come and help them because the Gnostics were in the area, and this Gnostic philosophy was gaining momentum. And uh, some of the things that the Gnostics taught was that Jesus could not have been God's son, they thought that he might have been a prophet of God, that he might have had God's power on him for a little while, but he, he could not have been God's son and been human, both. They denied that. And so they denied his uh, divine authority, and Paul's already dealt with that in <clears throat> some here in chapter 1. And that he talked about how Christ created the world and everything was made through him, and and Christ is our Savior, and, and uh, he's going to continue to work on these points through this letter. Uh, the Gnostics tried to blend the gospel with popular philosophies and religions of the day. They insisted on the observance of certain Jewish traditions. We're going to see some of that today. Uh, they taught the worship of angels. Again, we'll, we'll read that. And they taught that the knowledge that leads to the salvation is known only to a select few. They actually taught that there was a secret password for you to have salvation. And they would only tell you the password once you've been initiated into their religion. So it kind of seems silly, but uh, sometimes people fall into following some pretty silly things. And that's one thing I'm trying to uh, emphasize here as we're studying Colossians is that there's so many philosophies of men in the world today. <clears throat> uh, society wants to change the rules on what's right and wrong. Uh, political correctness seems to have more authority than Scripture sometimes. Uh, and it's People are being pulled away uh, from God's word by new philosophies today, just as they were in this time. So a lot of these things that Paul's talking about, the Gnostics, 
have a real bearing on today's world and what's going on in our media, in our colleges, in our uh, schools, um, in our just our movies and songs and uh, just papers, things that's just going on that where people will feel like they want to tell us how to think and what is right and what is wrong. And it is uh, not in parallel with God's word. And we're going to see Paul speak to that today. That's one of the things we need to be careful about. If someone's teaching something that is not in line with the Bible, then it's wrong. The Bible is the standard by which we know what is truth and what is false. So, so a lot of these verses will talk about maybe some subjects that <clears throat> are not <clears throat> relevant for us today, but the idea there is absolutely relevant. So, uh, verse eight, uh, he starts out: "See that you see that no one takes you captive. Be on the alert. Okay, be constantly alert." This word here for captive. In the Greek was used regularly for taking captives of war, leading them away as booty. And it depicts the false teachers as man-stealers, wishing to entrap them and, uh, and drag them away into spiritual enslavery. Okay? Uh, that is what the devil does. The devil is a man-stealer. He is trying to steal man from God, from Christ, all the time by any means necessary. And in this time, he was using the Gnostics to do it. In today's time, we have all kinds of modern philosophies and thinking that lead people and drag people away from Christ and from God. And uh, so we need to be careful of that. Um, the... Next phrase here says, through philosophy and empty deception. And Josephus was a writer at this time period, and he used the word philosophy as any elaborate system of thought and or moral discipline. Okay? And anything that was an elaborate system of thought or moral discipline was a, what he considered a philosophy. And I think that's kind of a broad range, but I, th I think it's, it's true. So, so don't let anyone take you captive through philosophy or empty deception. This empty deception is like a mirage in the desert. The Gnostic philosophy promised big things, but they couldn't deliver on its promises. That's the same way as alternative ways of thinking today and and uh, the modern humanistic views and, and uh, stuff we see today promises big things. We can all be one happy society. We just love one another. There is no right. There is no wrong. It is like a mirage. It's empty promises. So exactly going along with uh, today is the same idea as what the church there was struggling with. Now he goes on here, he says, according to the traditions of men. And uh, this is the first of three descriptive phrases that Paul uses to characterize this deceptive philosophy. And each of these phrases is a reason why it should be rejected. So it is the tradition of man. It's something that's been handed down from one generation to another. We see many, uh, many churches struggle with this of having traditions of men uh, being handed down and slowly and slowly they get away from Scripture and all of a sudden they're really following traditions and not following Scripture. And so we need to be careful. The second is according to the elementary principles of the world. That's according to the lower principle, the evil spirits in the world, the, really the workings of the devil is what it is. And um, so um, the 
maybe an example of the things that the devil uses today that a lot of people buy into instead of trusting in God is this idea of karma. That if you do something good, something good will happen to you. You do something bad, something bad will happen to you. That takes God out of the picture, don't it? it takes God out of the picture. And people will live their life by this idea of karma. I'm going to do good things because I want good things to happen to me. No matter how many good things we do, you can't get eternal life by doing good things. It's only through God's plan of salvation, of sending His Son Christ, His sacrifice, that we can have eternal life. Uh, karma's not going to get it. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention today is uh, because the Gnostics uh, worshipped angels, I think we should be uh, careful. I hear a lot of people that talk of... Uh, Guarding angels, man, my guardian angel really helped me out. Or my guardian angel working overtime on that. And uh, that's, again, it's taking God out of the picture, isn't it? When we are thankful for something that worked out for us, we're thankful for our safety, we shouldn't be thanking a guardian angel. We should be thanking God. And the devil uses all kinds of schemes to uh, just pull us away from Christ. And so... So here we mentioned two already, uh, the traditions of men, and then the second is these elementary principles of the world. And the third thing is just, he just comes out and says, rather than according to Christ. Uh, a philosophy or a, an idea is wrong if it's not according to Christ. And the um, author wrote this here, and I'm going to read it. It says, Christ is the standard by which all doctrine is to be measured. And any system, whatever it claims, must be rejected if it fails to conform to the revelation God has given to us in Him. Be because I think he did such a good job with that, I'm going to read it again. Christ is the standard by which all doctrine is to be measured. No matter what we hear, where we hear it from, who tells us, Christ is the standard by which all doctrine is to be measured. And any system, whatever its claims, must be rejected if it fails to conform to the revelation God has given to us in Christ. His Word. Okay? So, um, so there's two reasons why this deceptive philosophy uh, should be rejected. One is it's not according to Christ. And the second, Paul's going to work on here in the next uh, five, six verses. And it's the idea that the Gentiles, or <laughs> the Colossian people did not need the Gnostic ideas because they were already complete. They were already um, complete in Christ. And so, so we're going to see that here. Uh, so verse 9 says, um, For in him the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And Paul's sticking a little bit of a phrase in here again, because the Gnostics denied Christ and his deity. And he's saying, In Jesus, God's deity dwells. And... It did not descend on him and then leave him as the Gnostics taught. This word dwells is in present tense. It continues to dwell. God's deity was in Christ and it continues to be in Christ. It remains forever in bodily form, clothed within a body. Uh, Philippians 3.21 tells us that Christ has a glorified human body now. <clears throat> and in that glorified body dwells all the fullness of deity. Uh, just as a side note, we will get our glorified human body upon Jesus' return when Jesus comes again. But Jesus has his glorified body now. Uh, so Paul's saying that all of God, his supreme nature, is infinite entirety of God dwells in Christ now, which is not what the Gnostics were teaching. And Paul's reminding them of that. And now verse 10, 
He says, and you have been made complete. Okay, this is the idea. They don't need anything else. The same way we as Christians don't need to modify our morality or our philosophy because of political correctness, because of social pressure, because we have the complete word of God. We've been made complete already. We don't need any more. Uh, Christ's blood, as Christians, Christ's blood has made us righteous. We have his righteousness imputed onto us. We don't need something else to make us more righteous. We just need to follow Christ. And that's really what Paul's working at here. So he says, in him you've been made complete. And remember, I, I told you a couple weeks ago that the Gnostics were big on this idea of fullness, that they had the full knowledge and they, they knew more than anyone had ever known before. And uh, they, they were really egotistical about their, their knowledge. And so Paul uses this word fullness many times in the Colossians uh, letter because Christianity is where the fullness is, not in the Gnostic religion. And so this idea that in him you've been made complete, the word for complete in the Greek is also has the same root word as fullness. So Paul's sort of using a play on words here to remind the Colossian people they didn't need the Gnostic philosophy. They didn't need to pay any heed to it because they were already full. They were already complete. And he goes on here, uh, in him, okay, in him Christ, you've been made complete. And we saw in the first chapter of Colossians, that um, rule and authority, those words refer to two different orders of angels. Um, and there's nothing the angels can add. So here Paul's, again, working against this idea that the, the Gnostics were teaching about the worship of angels. And um, Christ is head over all, all the orders of the angels. Now verse 21 and in him you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Okay? So the circumcision made with hands was referring to the covenant, the physical circumstance that God made with Abraham back in Genesis chapter 17. But this isn't a circumcision made with hands. This is a physical circumcision. Okay? And he goes, And in him, Christ, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. It's a spiritual. It's not the human body. It's a spiritual circumcision. Um, Romans 2 verse 29 says that it is a circumcision of the heart. And that's really what God is interested in. So this spiritual circumcision circumcision God is interested in it already occurred in the Colossian people when they were immersed when they were baptized when they become Christians and they were already full they were already made complete uh, this has already been done so so then so let's finish this it says in him you were in Christ you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So it's a, this body of the flesh is our fleshly desires. We're no longer ruled by our fleshly desires. We have been spiritually circumcised by Christ. We can be ruled by this Christ's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So that's what that verse is saying. Now, uh, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6, the first six verses, about how the body of sin is done away when a man is immersed into Christ. So here also Paul's going to go on to say that the body of the flesh is removed when a man is immersed. So, so we take this verse here, in, in the last part of it, it says, in the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, and this is all one sentence in the Greek, like Paul is, is fond of doing, uh, having been baptized, having been buried with him in baptism, okay? That's when this spiritual circumcision happened, having been buried with him in baptism, in which 
you were also raised. Okay, so the the circumcision not made by hands, uh, this removal of the body of the flesh is that he talked about in verse eleven is is baptism. Buried here is a term that uh, really pictures nicely what is done when people are baptized. Uh, it, the Greek word for baptism is to baptizo, uh, to plunge, dip, or immerse. Uh, when people are, are buried in the waters of baptism, there is, it symbolizes a death and, and, a, and a rising to walk in newness of life. And we're going to see that here in just a second. Uh, so we've been buried with him in baptism. Um, t- Titus 3.5 uh, talks about immersion as a time when a cleansing that one cannot do to oneself occurs, but that which God provides. So that's a, that's a good verse, Titus 3, 5. Also Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in newness of life. That's exactly the picture here. That's exactly what's going on at baptism. So we'll continue here. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him. See, that's the second part of this picture, that we were raised up with him. Uh, it, it resembles the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's also in Romans 6, 4 there. In Romans 6, 5, 6 and 7 goes on and explains what it means to walk in this newness of life. And I'm going to read it because uh, it's really a good thing here. It says, uh, speaking of what happens at baptism, it, re- it says this, For we have become united, let me start again, For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we might no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. So it is this baptism, this death, this burial, this resurrection, where the old man is put away, we are dead to the sin, uh, the sin no longer has a hold on us. Christ's blood covers us. That, that's what is going on here. And he's talking about here in verse 12 and also in Romans 6. So having been buried with him in baptism, in which also you were raised with him, through faith in the working of God. Uh, some people say faith is a work, or baptism is a work. Uh, it is a work, it is the work of God. <laughs> It is not a work of us. We are, we are passive in it. It is a work of God. And that's what Paul says here, through faith and the working of God. God is the one who has done it. Uh, he, he finishes this verse with, who raised him from the dead. One of the things God did, one of the works he did, was he raised Jesus from the dead. Uh, one of the things he does for us is he forgives our sins. That's a working of God. Now, the... The next verse is going to identify another thing that the working of God accomplishes. Um, The same God who raised Christ from the dead also made us alive spiritually when we were baptized. Verse 13 says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Okay, this is before. Before they become Christians. Before verses 11 and 12, when they were dead in their transgressions, transgressions and the uncircumcision of their flesh, um, he, he made you alive together with him. There's a working of God. He made them alive. God raised Jesus from the dead and he made the Christians, he made the Colossian people alive, just like he made us alive at our baptism. Then he goes on, how's that? Having forgiven all our transgressions. Um, in this and the next couple verses, Paul unfolds what all is involved uh, in God making his people alive. One, he 
has forgiven us all our transgression, and two, he canceled their certificate of death. So we're going to see these two things. This is, uh, first, he, he has forgiven our transgressions. And it's, it's nice, Paul says, he's forgiven us. He includes himself in this. Uh, he, Paul is glad to do that. Paul is glad that he can be counted among those who God has done this to. Um, the word here for forgave is the same root word in the Greek uh, that grace has, and it means to grant a favor. And God's grace, God's forgiveness, His loving kindness, He grants us a favor. He grants us forgiveness. And you note the fullness of the forgiveness. It's all of our transgressions. That's what happens. Jesus' blood cancels all of our transgressions. And now verse 14 says, And having canceled out the certificate of death, consisting of degrees decrees against us and which was also hostile to us so uh, this is the second way that G that god is working he has canceled out the certificate of debt that we owe he has wiped out our debt uh, um, people say jesus paid a debt we could not pay that's absolutely true amen and um, he is in the next part of the verse says he has taken it away god has taken it away uh, the word picture here in the Greek is removing an obstruction that no longer intervenes between God and us. He's taken it away. Hebrews 10, 14 says, The death of Jesus was a once and for all sacrifice for sin. Uh, amen. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Again, amen. So how did he cancel our debt? Uh, how has he taken it out of the way? Having nailed it to the cross. That's the end of the verse there. Having nailed it to the cross. Through his own blood, Jesus has obtained eternal redemption. That's Hebrews 9, verse 12. Because of what happened on Calvary, God graciously can forgive you and me. And it's through the act of baptism that this happens. Um, now, verse 15 says, And when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, there's those two words again, isn't it? The rulers and authorities, these different groups of angels. Now, um, verse 15 is a very difficult uh, verse to get the exact meaning out of. Um, seems like everybody has a different view of what it really means. Uh, I think it's best that we continue with what's been said in Colossians when this idea of rulers and authorities has been listed. It's always been talking about angels. And so uh, when he disarmed the angels, uh, remember in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, it says that, that, that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels when he, and he's had to suffer death, okay? But he's now crowned with glory and honor. So it's, it seems this, that at, when, when Christ came to earth and as he went through the process of crucifixion, there was a time there when he was made lower than angels. But he's risen, and that is no longer the case. And in that way, he has disarmed them. He is, he is greater than them. He is, um, uh, Hebrews 1, verses 4 through 14, there's a nice section there. talks about how he is greater than the angels. Uh, so, again, Paul's using this because Jesus' superiority to even good angels is a powerful argument against the worship of angels, okay? So to me, this makes sense as we read through this verse. And that, I think that's Paul's message here. Uh, he, he's still working with the Gnostics. 
uh, idea that pe men should worship angels, and that is not good. Uh, we should worship Christ because Christ is uh, superior to angels. And it goes on here. He says, He made a public display of them and had triumphed over them. Okay? Um, it goes on here that and the author wrote that God publicly exhibited the angels as subordinates and servants to his sons. To his son. So that's what Paul's thinking here. That Christ is above even the good angels. That's what we've seen these uh, meanings to be. Uh, and, um, and there's no reason to worship angels. Uh, Christ is the one we have salvation through. Christ is the one uh, that rose from the dead. Christ is the one that we're bur buried with into, into baptism to rise in newness of life. And uh, there's no need for us to continue down uh, any other road or any other way of thinking. So we're going to stop there today. We'll start with verse 16 next week. Uh, Paul's going to get into uh, the idea that some of the Jewish ordinances and stuff that the Gnostic people were teaching. And Paul's saying, look, you don't need to do that. Uh, why? Because we've already been made complete. As Christians, we have no need to further our morality or philosophy past what Scripture says. Keep the Scripture as your guide, as your standard, uh, and you will always be right. So with that, we will stop there for today. Uh, Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Hope you have a good week. Uh, remember, rely on God's teaching in His Word, and don't be influenced by the influences of the world. Uh, the devil will try every trick he can think of to pull you away from Christ. And that's what Paul was teaching of here, and we must be on our guard that uh, we don't let the devil be a man-stealer and steal us. So, see you next week.